This webinar is proudly brought to you by IG South Africa. Visit igmarkets.co.za to open your trading account today. So this evening, we're looking for those winners. We're not looking for those stocks that go up 60% and we get all excited about them. Those are nice, but we really want, yeah, legal stuff. Yeah, that's me. Uh, we want these type of returns. This is really what we, this is what makes the difference in a portfolio, a fundamental difference. You know, we talk about 10 baggers. Yeah, these are 20 baggers in 10 years. These are 10-year screenshots. There are others. Some of them, EOH, even better, Coronation, uh, NASPAS, a bit of a lagger, only 1979. Uh, well, for Aspen, oddly enough, a bit of a lagger as well. Um, and it's trying to identify now what those will be in the future. And that, that is a, a, I mean, I'm just in a, in, a, in a, between a rock and a hard place here, right? Because if I get it right and you rush off and buy the share, I suggest, in 10 years' time, you're not going to remember I told you to buy it. <laughs> And if you buy it in 10 years time, it hasn't, you are going to remember that oak with the pointy shoes. Hopefully you've forgotten my name by then. <laughs> I'm surfing on the beach somewhere. So at, at the end of the day, without an absolute time, time machine, it is, it is a difficult process. And we've got to sort of really step back in that process. So I'm going to go through that. I've got a bunch of stocks at the end, and then I'm going to leave a, a bit of chunky time at the end so we can engage around different shares. Um, not so that we necessarily come to definitive conclusions, but so that we, we get some thinking going and some ideas bouncing around and we get an understanding of, of what we're trying to think and, and, and how we're trying to think about it. And if you look at this list of shares, I mean, Aspen. Uh, SA Druggist in 1995, uh, uh, Adrian Saad, who no one ever heard of at that point except his mother, um, bought a little company and did astounding 52 cents. That's now what, I don't even know what Aspen is now, it's north of 400. And, and the secret is a couple of things, but one of the, so, I mean, what does Adrian do best? He, 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 he does uh, deals, he's really, really good at deals, but what does he really, really do? Supply chain. And that's his secret. And, and those are the sort of things we're looking for. If we look at Apple, the last Apple results, everyone's terribly excited because Apple sells an iPhone every six seconds. That's impressive. But the really impressive part is they make an iPhone every six seconds in China and sell it in America. That is staggering. And, and Tim Cook's genius was, he, he was the one who put the supply chain together. So in many cases, it is more about, if you get the supply chain working, um, and in Apple, that supply chain is more challenging because of, of the quality they're looking for. But if we get that supply cha chain working, then a lot of the other things, which might not be that amazing, really fall into place. Put it the other way. If supply chain doesn't work, it just doesn't happen. I, I used to have an iPhone until I went to MTN store to get an iPhone 5. They didn't have stock. I'm now being on Android for the last three years. Now, uh, in truth, Apple doesn't really know where South Africa is. They don't really care about us. That would never happen in New York or California or London or, or anywhere like that. Um, Capitec, what did they do? Well, they, they basically just did innovation. They just said, you know what, banking's really quite simple. And the problem is the banks have legacy systems. Paper. I mean, one part doesn't talk to the other part. If you phone home loans and want to ask about your vehicle finance, they're like, we don't sell vehicles. Um, and, and, and banks have been trying for over a decade to get what they call a one client view. So you could phone anyone and talk about anything that you want around your banking product, and they can't do it. And we can see the distinction. Cost of income of the big four banks is around 55%, and Capitec it's around 33%. Their secret was no paper. Everything is centralized, everything's computerized. On top of that, they layered a four rand or five rand 60 bank account instead of a 285 rand bank account, whatever the case may be. So yes, there was other clever bits. But they could do that because of those computers at the core of it. And that's what keeps their cost of income so massive, massively low. Uh, NASPAS, NASPAS and, and it says, Chris Becker said perhaps best, you throw enough spaghetti at the wall, some of it sticks. He just bought stuff. He just bought stuff left, right, and center. Uh, he, at one point, they, well, they own a big chunk in Mailru, and Mailru owned 4% of Facebook, which they sold post-IPO. Um, but their big one, of course, is Tencent. Their, their, their core is, is really, in a sense, is the, the uh, uh, DSTV, which is their cash cow, which generated the cash, which enabled them to go and buy things such as Tencent, because without that, they couldn't have been able to, to, to afford it. So all of these have got your particular reasons as to what were those one or two little sparks. But the trick is it's hindsight, and, and that's lovely and great fun and makes for a, a, a good chat around your now overly expensive whiskey but it doesn't get us the next chair. So what are we looking for going forward? We want those. We get a lot of smalls and smalls, and hopefully we never get the big losses, African banks. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that, should I? 
I won't say African Bank one more time the whole evening, I promise. We get rid of the big losses. We're not going to talk about that this evening, but we need to find those big winners. And, and they, you know, a portfolio which trundles along, you've got a nice selection of shares and does all right is great. But you get out of a portfolio of 10 or 15 stocks, you get just one of those that does your 10 or 20 times bagging in a decade or two. And it, it, it fundamentally alters. It'll take a 25% annualized return to a 35% annualized return. And that extra 10% has humongous, massive implications over the long term. Uh, it means in retirement, we can afford the whiskey that Minister Nene has outpriced from us. Um, and we don't have to get box wine. We can get wine in bottles and stuff like that. So it, it's fundamentally important that we find them. Um, so what are we really looking for? The key point is, in all of those, there were trends. And we, I, I hate the phrase disruptors because it's not, I mean, yes, it is about disrupting. But no, it's not so much about disrupting. It's about what are those big trends. And to me, the trend that is currently happening has been happening since probably the 80s, although identifiably from the 90s, and will probably carry on, <clears throat> excuse me, for some time to go. When I say some time, 10, 20, 50 years more, uh, and more likely 50 than 10, is a consumerization, an urbanization, if you will. 350 million Chinese people have gone from living in a rural place to living in a city. The implication of that is humongous. The first thing is they get to a city, and it's quite tough. Uh, in many cases, they're language issues, they're cultural issues. You know, you're, you're what we call a country bumpkin in our language, and now you move to the city and you've got to re realize that there's taxis and they're going to run you over and stuff like that. Um, so the, 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 the first bit's a little bit hard, but then they start to slightly get ahead, and then they go and buy a cell phone. And first generation does all right. Second generation does better. They've got more education. They, 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 they suddenly want to employ someone to, to mind their children or something like that. And those little things, when you spread it across 350 million people in China alone, make humongous changes. And, what, and, and China, so they've pulled 350 million. They reckon they've got another 350 million to go. Um, there's probably another six or seven hundred million in Africa. There's probably another six or seven hundred million in India. Um, so we're talking potentially globally two billion people who are going to come into consumerization, who are going to use things for the first time that we just can't imagine living without. Running water as a start at a base base level, the ability to 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 I mean, white appliances, small things like fridges. Um, you know, the electrification of South Africa, one of the major implications of electrification of South Africa was not load shedding. It was massive sales of fridges because now you can plug your fridge in. Yeah, that's short. So it's those massive trends and, and it moves up the scale. Ultimately, one of the benefactories will be um, there's that company in America and I can't remember their name, but their claim to fame is they sell yoga kit. I can't imagine you make money off it. But again, what happens when you become richer and, and, and more upper class and more stressed, etc.? You want to go and do some artisanal stuff. You want to drink expensive homemade beer. And apparently you want to do yoga. So they sell leotards and yoga mats. And they make billions of dollars off it. And their sales are going through the roof. And that's a direct result of consumerism. Nike, another example. Capitech. Capy tech because people want banks. You know, when you're working on a wine farm in, in, in Western Cape and you played with a pup suck, you don't need a bank account. But when you've moved to a city and got a real job, now you need a bank account. And it might just be a single five rand, 60 rand a month capy tech. But it's a humongous trend that's running through. And we're seeing it in banking. We're seeing it in retail. We're seeing it all over the place. But those are places that are particularly defendable and benefiting from it. We, we see it in telecommunications. But it's becoming, I mean, I'm a big fan of MTN. I'm a, I'm a, I was going to say a big shareholder, big for me, not by MTN standards, uh, shareholder of MTN. But the ability to defend MTN's turf is just nigh on impossible. I mean, I've told the story where I went off contract about three years ago. I buy my phone direct out of the US from Google. It's unlocked. It costs $350. And I tried every operator in the country one month at a time. So I started with, uh, uh, Vodacom, who I'd been with since 1994, went to MTN, went to ATAR, went to Cell C. Um, I loved Cell C, hey? No one phones. Your phone never rings. You don't get email. <laughs> I was sorely tempted to stay. I mean, I was paying like only 300 bucks a month to stop people phoning me. I mean, that is a service I like. Um, 
I ended back at MTN. And then last week, my phone died. Long story, I buy a new phone. It's got a dual SIM. So I stick my voice one in, so my phone number is the same, and I shop around. And I find Axis in, I think, PE are selling me 10 gigs of data for 200 rand in a SIM. So I buy that, and I stick it in the phone. And when the 10 gigs is gone, I'll shop around and buy another one. So telcos, yes. But what they haven't yet got right is locking the customer in. Now, I've got ideas on why and how they can do it. But thus far, they haven't managed to do it. And that's your defendable moat. You need a moat that you can defend. Um, the Africa, Asia, China story broadly, I mean, mining, but not mining itself. You do not want to be a miner. You mine a commodity. What does that word mean? Commodity, nothing special. Your, your ounce of platinum is the same as any other ounce of platinum, and you don't even get to determine what the price is. But mining support services, ah, now that might be clever. There's stuff there, and that's a uh, uh, consolidated infrastructure group. We've got AES in Angola who basically clean up after the oil wells. In fact, not after, whilst you're drilling offshore, they're cleaning there. So that's a nice idea, but there's a problem here with mining broadly. It's the cyclical nature of it. I'll get that to the next slide. Um, again, retail, again, TMT, but again, I worry about the, the – the, what's your distinction if you've got TMT? TM, you know, how does MTN – the only way MTN keeps me in is because of my number, but I can port it. I've ported it five times in two years. It, it's just, you know, it, it's now just, I mean, it, it, it apparently sometimes it goes wrong um, and your phone doesn't ring for three days. I don't see the downside of that. The porting has become an easy. I've gone from spending 1,200 rand a month with Vodacom, uh, including data, and I'm, I used six, seven, eight gig a month of my phone on data. I'm using two, two, maybe 400 rand a month in total. So my bill has just absolutely collapsed down. Um, and, and yeah, the first secret is, oddly enough, it's cheaper on pay as you go than it is on contract. And that's just a completely anonymy and completely wrong. So if we then look at the ones to avoid, and as always, there's usually more to avoid than to actually worry about. And the first one we always, always want to avoid is cyclical stocks. The problem with cyclical stocks is that when they're booming, they're doing brilliant and they're making lots of money. The problem with cyclical stocks is when they're booming and doing brilliantly, we're busy sitting back in our chair, sipping the expensive whiskey, patting ourselves on the back, thinking how brilliant we are, and we forget to sell. You have to remember to sell your cyclical stocks. Your two examples, construction and commodities, both hard and soft commodity. By soft, I mean the agries, sugar and the like. And, and, and the logic's quite simple. I mean, let's look at sugar. So about six or seven years ago, the price of sugar started to go through the roof. Uh, I think, I, mean, I forget, it was hitting 25 pounds or uh, 25 cents a pound, whatever they could. Sugar was going through the roof, record highs. So what happens? Farmers around the world look at this and think, yo, check at the price of sugar. So they start planting sugar. So the supply increases faster than the demand is. So what happens? You flood the market with supply, uh, and the demand can't keep up, and the price goes down. So what you see with commodities is just that continual sort of boom, bust, boom, bust. And now what we're seeing with sugar is, is we're moving into the bust stage. Uh, demand is, is still there, but not as strong as it was. Supply has gone through the roof partly aided by increased production, Ilova and Tonga are two of the culprits, and then really, really good rainfall in the particular areas, which meant record crop yields. Oddly enough, the floods, which we've been seeing in recent times uh, north of us, might actually help because it might get some of that sugarcane sort of into the ocean rather than, than into the chocolate bars. But it means that they're boom or bust. And it means that if we hold them for a 10 or 20 year period, we we may or may not do spectacularly well out of them. And for large periods of time, we're going to do nothing. And I'm not convinced. We can go look at uh, Anglo Platinum. You could have bought it at 60 bucks a share, and you could have sold it at 1500 No one did. I mean, some people did buy it at 60 No one sold it at 1500 because at 1500 we believed our own story, didn't we? That we were absolute geniuses. We were stock pickers that made Warren Buffett look like an amateur. And this thing was going to, 1500 was warming up, man. This thing was going to 10,000 rand a share. Why not? be the first 10,000 rand share in the JSC. So we don't exit. And then it comes back. And now it's at, what's Anglo Platinum? 400, 500? Will it get back to 1,500? Sure. When? Not anytime soon. Not with Platinum under 1,200. They need, uh, when their last time they were at 1,500, Platinum was at 2,200 an ounce. I reckon by my cokes, they need Platinum at 3,500 dollars an ounce. And then maybe they're a 1,500 rand share. And that's a big maybe. 
It's just, it, it, there's, there's no fun there. Construction, same story. I mean, so, so let's stick with mining for a moment. What is your edge in mining? Your edge in mining as a business, your defendable moat, is an ability to get it out of the ground cheaper than anybody else. That's all you've got. I can do it cheaper. That's a nice moat as long as you can. But eventually, you run out of being able to do it cheaper. And eventually, those holes get deeper and deeper, and your labor starts to, 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 to strike, and your ESCOM fees start going higher, and your ability to do cheaper is hard. And then you find some gold, which is quite nice and very accessible and a great find. Unfortunately, it's in the jungle in Papua New Guinea. I, 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 mean, I say jungle. I mean parts of the world no one's ever been to in the history of the world. Maybe a dinosaur 60 million years ago. So now you've got to, you know, put roads, power supply, water, dig holes, get labor. This is no longer cheap. So your, your, your edge is infinitely undefendable. We look at Pan-African, cheapest miner in South Africa. But at some point, they ran out of cheap gold. Uh, in the olden days, <clears throat> you'll remember back in the 80s, some of you will, when a gold mine was a single hole in the ground. One mine, one company, one business. Beatrix, that's it. And, when, and, and you've got a 15-year life of mine. You pay a 8% dividend yield, and over the life of the mine, you'll get back 130% in dividends. And at the end of it, you've got a hole, you walk away, you start somewhere else. And then our miners got big and lazy, and that's a, it's a global issue. You see. And then the worst part is we at the top of the market, when prices are expensive, what do they do? They try and buy each other at the biggest price possible. I mean, the best thing that ever happened to BHP Billiton in its life is that it didn't buy Rio Tinto in 2007. Um, and then we get to the bottom of the market, and what do they do? They start getting rid of everything. So they buy high, sell low, which is, I mean, you know, if you know Investing 101. <laughs> But then we have the construction guys. So what's their edge? The only edge they have is price. That's all you can do. All you can do is be, ah, no, there is another option. You can collude on price. <laughs> We've decided that's not cool. 1.5 billion rand later, colluding is evil. But all you have is price. Because you know what? A bridge is a bridge, hey? I mean, I couldn't build a bridge. I accept. And if you're an engineer right now, you're thinking, ooh, a bridge is hard. Yes, it is. But if you're two engineers, they can both build a bridge, assuming they're civil engineers and have been trained in the art of bridge building. It's just a bridge. So what's your edge? Price. Which means race to the bottom. Which means any road. I mean, rule 101 in business, do not get into a price war unless you're shop right. <laughs> no, hey, Wati Basan can get into a war with anybody who will win. But as construction companies, you are in a price war. And you're in a global. So what are South African construction companies doing? Brilliant. They're going off to Australia, where they find Spanish, Italian, German, British, American, and Chinese construction companies. Huh. Okay. So they go to Africa, where they find British, Italian, Spanish, German, Chinese, and English construction companies. Construction is a global commodity. And your defendable edge is price. So what do you do? Low margin contracts, something goes wrong, bit of rain, you mispriced it, loss-making contracts. You know, up until 2008, we'd never heard of such a thing as a loss-making contract in construction. Now all we ever hear is loss-making contracts. So short answer, we stay away. I mean, they're fun to dabble in. I mean, I have a very simple rule. I just stay away, you know, because I will forget to sell. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. Because what happens? Nothing. They go sideways. And I'm being generous. Actually, they go down. But let's pretend they go sideways. And they go sideways. And then they go sideways some more. And then, they, and then you go fill up your whiskey glass. And then vroom, vroom. And, they, <laughs> and you missed it. That's it. There was your five seconds and you were topping up your whiskey. So thanks, but that's not for me. I, I, you know, and and it's, a, it's a lesson I learned the hard way. I went bullish on, on Stefanucci stocks. I went bearish. I went bullish. I went bearish. And the whole time the price was 10 rand. That happened over three years. One time, at one point, me and Sepa Madiba almost had enough shares to get a seat on the board. I was lucky that I escaped the price I paid. In truth, over a three-year window, I went backwards. I could have made better money in the bank. Not much because low interest rates, but better money in the bank. So yeah, I just saw my leave them alone. And are they your, your giant killers? No, they're not. We leave them alone. And then motless. So what is your moat? Your moat is that thing which makes you defendable. What is MTN's moat? Nothing. I mean, MTN's moat should be clever. So, M so Sol C, the network you, uh, you love to hate, or hate to love. Actually, I think I hate to love it. 
South Sea sponsors the best rugby team in the world. The Sharks. Okay, we don't always play good rugby. We don't win much, but we're the best rugby team in the world. <laughs> Stay with me here, people. So what should they do? They should say, if you are a South Sea subscriber and a Sharks fan, you can watch the game live on Saturday and it won't count to your data cap. Boom. Suddenly, I'm a South Sea subscriber and I don't dare leave because I want to watch the game. Clever things like that. We're not seeing it yet. Will they do that? I don't know. I, we, we're not seeing it. I mean, we're not seeing it anywhere in the world. If you look at Europe, if you look at uh, uh, the US, essentially they're coming down to utility companies like your water and your power, and those are nice because you sell lots of liters and make lots of, uh, the, the, sorry, tiny margins, but you sell enough liters to make it up. And that's what the telcos eventually become. They are moatless. Um, if, if, if you are, are Woolies, what's your moat? Brand. I mean, I can go and buy an overpriced piece of meat wrapped in four pieces of plastic anywhere in the world, but I can't buy it for that price anywhere but Woolies. <laughs> and having bought it at Woolies, what do I get? I get the gold Woolies packet. And I get to walk out with my gold Woolies packet. In fact, my housekeeper, who's clever, so she shops at, actually, she shops at Pick and Pay. I don't own Pick and Pay shares. That's terrible. She shops at Pick and Pay, but she takes the Woolies packet. <laughs> She puts her pick and pay goods in the Woolies packet, and then she walks the long way home. So I see her one very hot day during Heatwave Joburg, and I say to her, surely you want to lift home? And anyway, what are you doing here? This is like nowhere between. She's like, no, no, she doesn't want to lift. Why not? Because she's walking down the road with her Woolies packet. <laughs> brand. Can you take 50 billion rand and fight the Woolies brand? You could. Could you think of something better to do with your 50 billion rand? You bet ya. Brand. Now, brands can be destroyed, but that is a moat. That is a massive, massive moat, and it is humongously important. So you need those type of moats, and different industries are going to have different moats. In the banking space, it's regulators. You want to start to bank, it's really easy. Go visit the Reserve Bank and take about 10 billion rand deposit, and then they will consider your application. I think the deposit is refundable, but uh, really, do you want to take on the banks? I mean, Capitec did it. They've succeeded. But at the time of Capitec, there were about two dozen second-tier banks in South Africa. We have Capitec. The others, Regal Bank, uh, uh, Business Bank, uh, and so they go. And some of them were run by really, really smart people. One of them survived. So you need that moat. For example, IT hardware is, does not have a moat. And, and here there's a distinct... So, we call them drop, uh, box droppers, right? They sell you a computer. That's it. Uh, Pinnacle. I, that's why I could never get myself to buy a Pinnacle, because what do Pinnacle do? They sell you a box. What's your edge on selling a box? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Your edge is that you sell a lot of them. But at some point in time, you start to lose market share, currently happening. Did they lose it for the fair reasons? Irrelevant. They, you know, we can see must take your own Mesa are picking them up. It's just a box. You know, either you're buying Windows or Mac, and if you're buying Mac, there's really simple. There's like two of them, and if you're buying Windows, how do you choose which Windows machine you want? I have no idea. I, that's why I went to Mac. It got too complicated. You know, what driver do I want for my heart? I don't know. I want it to go fast. So, and again, back to commodities. Why? I mean, what is that word, commodity? You have no edge. Legal risks. Tobacco. British Marine Tobacco is a brilliant company, but I had to sell it last year because at some point, the idea of smoking cigarettes is going to be just like you did what? <laughs> so what we're seeing is cigarette smoking is moving eastwards. After the, after the, the, the court cases in America in the late 80s and 90s, which didn't bankrupt the industry, um, and, and we're seeing decreases of smoking in, in, in the West, and we're seeing it pick up in the East, and we're seeing a whole bunch happening, but we know where tobacco smoking is going. Two examples. If you were born in Australia after 1st of January 2000, it is illegal for you to smoke. End of story. Illegal for you to smoke if you were born after the 1st of January 2000. So those kids are now 15. I mean, the hard part is there's a kid born on the 31st of December 99, and a kid born on the 1st, <laughs> only one of you can smoke. But play that forward 50 years, where if you're under 65, you're not allowed to smoke in Australia. But then it gets better. So go to Tasmania. Tasmania is contemplating a law which will out 
law smoking entirely in the state. It will be illegal to smoke in the state, anywhere. You can go find one of the biggest sheep farms in the world, although they don't farm sheep there. They farm those little dragons. Something. What do they, I don't know what they do there. And you can go stand in the middle of a field, and you won't be allowed to smoke. New legislation coming into South Africa, you will not be allowed to smoke undercover. End of story. If you go stand in the Karoo and under an umbrella, you're not allowed to smoke because you are under... No, because people were fudging the law. So new law is simple. If you are undercover, no smoking. That means smoking sections in restaurants, gone. Smoking sections in bars, gone. Smoking sections in casinos, gone. Casinos will lose 30% of their revenue over a three-year period and we get it back after another five years. We know that because we saw it happen in Australia and New Zealand when they imposed that legislation. Tobacco is out. But tobacco is the easy one. Health is the issue. Healthcare, if we have a consumerized nation, if those one and a half to two billion people are moving into the cities, what's one of the first things they're going to want? Health. And it might just be a visit to the clinic to get inoculations for the baby. Whatever it might be, they're going to want health. So we look at health and we think this is a space. But there is a problem because what happens? Governments look at health and they say this is a human right. And it's incredibly hard to say health isn't a human right. Of course health is a human right. So what happens is you make a drug such as ARVs for people who have HIV AIDS and you charge 15,000 Rand per person per month for your ARV treatment. And you make great money. And then in 2002, the governments of India, South Africa and Brazil come to you and say, you know what? We can't afford to pay 15,000 Rand per person per month. We have millions of people dying. We need a solution. And the solution is you give it to us at how about 2 Rand 20 per person per month. The drug company said, don't be stupid. The government said, look, here's your option. Give it to us at 2 Rand 20 and make some money, or we'll modify a generic. And they're like, we'll go to the World Health Organization. And the governments of India, South Africa, and Brazil said, we don't give a hoot. So what happens? In 2000, you were paying 15,000 Rand per month per person for ARVs. Today, you pay 2 Rand 20. 2 Rand 20 is still 1 Rand 94 profit. I mean, it's not a bad markup, eh? <laughs> But here's the thing. So we are deeply excited. We want to own the drug company that discovers the cure for cancer. Man, how much are we going to sell that for? Because the trick is, is that cancer is a rich person. Do, well, it's not. Lots of people get cancer. But there's a different demographic in terms of there will be a lot of rich people getting cancer. Forget 15,000 rand per month per person for treatment. There are people there who will pay millions. Of course. If you've got the money and you're about to die, you pay the money. And they'll make a lot of money for a while until the governments of Brazil, India, South Africa, and probably a few others go to the cancer drug manufacturers and say, hey guys, we don't like your pricing. How about 3 Rand 20? We're feeling generous this time. So what you want is the company who makes the next Viagra, lifestyle drugs. No, serious. I mean, that, or hip replacements. There's a problem with hip replacements. I, I got a, a fake knee and a fake hip in 93. I had to replace it five years later. In 98, the doctor says, oh, this one will last 10 years. In 2008, the doctor says, yeah, Ugh, don't, don't worry, it's fine. This thing will now last forever. So in, in literally in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of 15-year 15, 15 window, we went from replacing every five years to something that will outlive me. Point is, we're doing a lot more hip replacements, but I'm not sure if the math works. So healthcare is great, but legislative issue, issues worry me. We've seen it already in South Africa, single exit pricing. We've seen it with ARVs. Uh, we've seen it with potentially nas national health insurance. We don't know how that's going to shake out. There are legislative risks there. They can take a lot of shine off it. Notwithstanding, Aspen's done brilliant. And I'm not saying take your Aspen's and run like heck, um, get out of, out, of, out of Dodge. But I, I, I got to you know, is Aspen always going to be able to spin to this degree? I know the argument. They do a lot of generics. Yes, noted, lacquer. But there are, there are, I mean, the best product you want to get to in the health space is diapers. <laughs> adult diapers. We sell more adult diapers in Japan than Shoren, Ditto, Germany. And uh, no one's going to ever force that price down here. Huh? So things to avoid. Just sort of stay away. And I always like to first start my list with things I don't like because we get rid of them and then it makes my, heart, my whole life a whole lot easier. Then we get to the stuff we do like and we look at Porter's Five Forces. And what is Porter? So this was a management textbook in the 1980s. Don't read it. It is the most boring, horrible thing ever. This picture will suffice. And it tells you a bunch of things. What are the things that make companies competitive? Things such as bargaining power of customer. As an MTM user, I have bargaining power. I will leave. Um, bargaining power of supplier. As Mr. Shoprite, uh, uh, Mr. Visa, he has absolute bargaining power of his suppliers. 
He phones you up. So I'd like a million tons of baked beans. I'll pick them up a Tuesday, quarter past nine. I'll pay you at 120 days. I'll give you two rand a tin. Uh, he blinked. Uh, Ma'am, would you supply me? Uh, she didn't nod. Ah, uh, there, that guy there. Yeah, he nodded. Boom, I'll be there Tuesday, quarter past nine. He's got the power. He's got absolute power. He hasn't got much power on the other end. Although he manages his, in other words, to us, he manages it by price. And as he will tell you, retail is a, is, is, is a, is a scale game and retail is a, is a game of, of, of price. It's about price. Um, so you absolutely want the threat of new entrants into the industry. Yeah, I mean, MassMart, I remember interviewing uh, Wati Basson. I, I can't call him Wati, so I had to say Mr. Basson. I know, he is a, I, I, I call him Mr. He's only, Mr. I said to him, you're worried about Walmart. You might teach, they might teach us some lessons. He laughs heartily as he does best. He says, no, no, my friend, we will teach them lessons. So far, 3-0 to Wati in teaching Walmart. So threat of new entrants. If you've got an industry that's comfortable and you've got a 20% operating margin, and what do you know that's happening? Someone's looking at your industry and saying, 20% operating margin? I wouldn't mind a slice of that. If you've got an industry at a 2.5% operating margin, people look at that and think you've got to be kidding. I'm not going anywhere near that. You're one misstep and you're out of money. So in fact, what you want is deeply competitive industries. Competition is a good thing. Capitec succeeds because of the competition in the bank, uh, banking space. We know there's competition in the banking space. They got lazy, but it's succeeding. ShopRite is, is, is killing it because of the competition in the retail space. And, and still the Americans will try and come along. Threat of substitutes is real and massive, and that is a little bit left field. And I give you the example of a company called Awa who used to make uh, telephone answering machines in the 80s, those old telephone answering machines with cassette reels and a blinking red light. Um, the young kids in the audience have no idea what I just said there. And back in the 80s, they had a billion dollar a year business and then electronic telephones. So when I got my first mobile in 1994, voicemail cost 60 cents per message to retrieve. Um, and I have four voicemail boxes and they don't cost me a cent. Our no longer exists as a maker of, of uh, voice answering machines. And really, who saw that coming? Uh, you know, I, it was, in the 1980s, you thought you had the best business in the world, and boom, you are now just dead and gone. So uh, substitute pro products is, is significantly a uh, uh, threat to industries. And, and oftentimes, they're left field, so we have to watch out for them. We have to start to see that, hey, Vodacom's giving me free voicemail. That little hour thing, that tape machine which eats the tape is not around for very much longer. Um, and you want that competitive rivalry because that competitive rivalry plays into it. You want competitive industries. So let's delve into it. What do you want? You want strength. You want product. You want service. You want supply chain and the like. You want, you know, what is part of Woolly's strength? It's the ability to delight customers. I told the story all, my, all the time. My sister buys a lamb's wool jersey from Woolworths. It says hand wash only. So she sticks it in the washing machine. It gets destroyed. She goes back to Woolies. She said your jersey that said hand wash only went in the machine. It's destroyed. Willie said, what color would you like replacement? To which I'm like, you are kidding me. Willie's are, we like to delight our customers, even the silly ones. <laughs> I would never say that in front of my sister. If you quote me, I will deny it. You know what? She buys stuff at Willie's, eh? Because even if you mess it up, Willie's come to the party. And, and those are the sort of things. Longevity, stuff that we can see being out there. And, you know, what are we looking in the cell phone space? We're looking at a cell phone space that will be different in 20 years. How? Don't know. I do know it will be a commodity. We will be doing, we will be doing, forget gigabytes, we will be doing terabytes, petabytes of data. Voice will no longer exist. It will all just be data because voice is data at the end of the day. But I don't know how it's going to morph. And that makes me say, hmm, not so convinced by it. We want to be able to see that growth going forward. I mean, where is, let's go to ShopRite. What's your ShopRite growth? Broadly, it's uh, GDP plus inflation. They're not managing that right now, but it's GDP plus inflation plus any expansion that they can potentially do. You, you want to see where it's going to come from. The ShopRite benefit is, and we've seen it, is urbanization. Government grants. One of the <laughs> biggest benefits to ShopRite over the last decade, government grants. Those government grants that went up old age pension and now gets, I think, 14, 40 a month from April, um, that extra 30 rand, it's going to basically go on transport and food. Hopefully, as a ShopRite shareholder, more food than transport, but I, that's where it goes to. You know, so, so they've been a huge benefiter of it. 
and it's that urbanization. And ultimately, they shop up. They leave. I mean, the aspiration is to leave ShopRite um, and to go to Woolies. And then when times get tough, you go back to ShopRite, you go to Checkers, and then ultimately to YouSave and Boxer, and, <laughs> and you move up and down the pyramid. But the aspiration is Woolies. ShopRite keeps them because it sits in the middle. That's the beauty of ShopRite. People going up, people going down, ShopRite catches them all. Nice and simple in that sense. The hard part, but the critically important part, is management. Stephen Saad, I called him Adrian earlier. That's why the gentleman there squiffed me. Stephen Saad, um, Al Gore, ugh, Adrian Gore. Getting my names wrong. Um, no, I'm too scared to say anyone. Y.T. Bisson, Maton, Yanni Maton. We have we have global leaders. The SAB group. I mean, everyone at SAB. I mean, forget doing an MBA. Go work at SAB for three years. You'll learn more. Um, we have got brilliant, brilliant leadership in places, not in abundance, not billions of them, but we've certainly got them. But how do we spot them? That is the massively, massively hard part. And we spot some of them by simple math. Go and read the, the, the annual report, but go read the one from five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, and then the one from this year and see what they say versus reality. See what the plans were and did they deliver. See when they said it would be tough, it was tough. See, when they, see if they at least understand the business. Look at how the business is evolving. You can see the brilliance of PSG. You can see the brilliance uh, at, 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 at uh, Discovery. You can see the brilliance. You can see, with all respect, the lack of brilliance at the telcos. Telcom, Vodacom, MTN. What have they done that like you like, wow, check at that? Nothing. Not a thing. I mean, they gave us cell phones, lacquer. But that was tech developed in the, in the 50s in, 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 in Eastern. Uh, not there. Lack of brilliance in the sense there. And then there's other issues. We'll touch on those. And you want the sectors that are going to benefit both. So you stay away from the cyclicals. You touch carefully in healthcare. I'll come back to healthcare. You, you go for those sectors that are going to really benefit from this, this booming middle class, from this consumerization that is going to play out. What are people going to do? They're going to want to educate their children. They're going to want to buy insurance. They're going to want to buy cars and white appliances. They're going to want to upgrade their homes. They're going to want uh, uh, TVs and fancy phones. They're going to want to upgrade their shopping experiences. They're going to want to have holidays. We can see what their touch points are going to be. None of this is rocket science. Sit down and say, if you were earning 50,000 rand a month more, what would you do? Aside from quit your job and run to a desert island. I mean, what, so what are you going to do with it? You know what? Probably what you would do with it, that's what everyone else would do with it. And it might not be 50. It might just be an extra 500, an extra 1,000. It might be someone who's come from earning practically nothing, maybe in a government grant, and now actually getting a salary might be a modest 12,500 working as a rock driller at, in, in Implats, um, but it, it's suddenly money to spend. Where are they going to spend it? We can see where it's going to go. There's some areas we can't tap, transport. Yeah, unless you want to go and buy a, a, a Caltex garage in Rustenburg, Transport's a whole bunch of fleet of taxis. Transport's a tough place to touch into. But we can see where it's going to start to bleed through. And then always, 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 always buy the quality. Buy the winners. Buy the best. Buy the absolute winners. You know what? We're terrified of all-time highs. Aspen closed at an all-time high. I don't know what it did today, but at some point last week, Aspen closed at an all-time high. Highest price ever in the history of closing for Aspen. Every previous all-time high in the last 20 years of Aspen, if you had bought at an all-time high, you have made money. Every single time you bought at an all-time high in Aspen, you made money. Ponder that a moment. If you go to the cyclicals, pick a construction stock, pick a, uh, a, a mining stock. If you bought at any all-time high in the last 10 years, you've lost money. But those winning companies, and I'm not saying you buy at all-time highs. I'm saying don't be scared of them. Because a company that's on an all-time high today means every previous all-time high in the history of that company has been a profitable place to buy the share. Price, quick point on this. Price is important, but we mustn't get overstressed by it. What are we looking for? We're looking for giant movers. Typically, we want to go find a small little penny stock. Sure, that's fine. But you know what small little penny stocks is? Typically, they also hit the wall. So I use... 10 years ago, NASPAS was a 35 billion rand company. And folks would have said to you, ah, that's too big, it can't go. It's up 20-fold. 20 20-fold 20 in 10 years. 
People tell you a 35 billion rand company can't go up 20-fold. Nonsense. Of course it can. And in fact, there are better examples. I mean, uh, uh, EOH is up 30-fold in that 20-year period. 35 billion, it's now seven. Can we see NASPASS as a trillion rand company? Yeah. Not if, when. And probably sooner than you think. Can we see it as a two trillion rand company? Sure. So think about this. Currently, we've got two, 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 two one trillion rand companies on the JSC. SAB Miller, British American Tobacco. They're both worth over a trillion rand. Let's jump forward 10 years. For them to double in value, they've got to do 7.5% growth per year. 7.5% per year, and they are two trillion rand companies. Which means in 10 years' time, we're going to have 20 or 30 trillion rand plus companies. So why can't NASPASS become a two trillion rand company? And I'm talking price, not value. Hey, value is a different game of fish entirely. We'll touch on that. So don't get put off and say it's a 35 billion rand company. It can't go up. Ten years ago, your 35 rand billion rand company has given you 2,000% return in the last decade. <clears throat> so we worry. We want the small caps. We want the extra risk. But 100 billion can become two trillion. So let's get into some, some stocks. We're looking at the sector strengths, the qualities, the management, the market cap, the value. The... Uh, the, the, all of them are subjective, except, of course, market cap. Let's start at the top, Discovery. 70 billion, don't stress it. Can Discovery become a one and a half trillion rand company? You betcha. The key thing that I took away from the results earlier in the week was Adrian Gore's comment that in Pu An, which is their Chinese business, and a direct quote from him is, it might be our 10 cent. So health. Health scares the behetness out of me. So why not go to a health administrator? Because what happens when we want, so when you're poor and you're just getting into, into consumerization, you, you go into the clinic and you're paying 13 or whatever, 23 rand for your clinic trip, etc. But ultimately, what do you want? You want medical insurance. You want for the emergencies. You want that management. And if there's a company in the world that does it incredibly well, a global leader with vitality and with their products, it is discovery. Are they in a good sector? Health, yes. But the best part is they're in a sector which scares the heck out of me, but they're in the space which is not scary. Does government legislate there? Yes. In terms of, of how much cash you've got to hold, there's a lot of issues there. Yes, they do. But in terms of are they going to ban discovery? No. Are they going to arm wrestle? Yes. Does discovery mind how much it costs for ARVs? Discovery probably quite likes ARVs at 2 Rand 24. Well, think about it. They're paying for it, eh? When cancer treatment comes out, they would quite like to pay three rand twenty for cancer. Single exit pricing. Well, hey, they love single exit pricing. None of this ripping me off for my drugs about the drug the uh, pharmaceuticals about the pharma store. No, no, no. They love single exit pricing. So all that legislation risk, boom. Is it quality? Yes. Is vitality a thing of wonderment? Yes. It absolutely is. It saves you money and makes you healthier. Wow. I mean, where, they, where's the bad thing there? And they're spinning it out. So they couldn't do America. They left. They left Vitality behind. They're pushing Vitality into the UK. They're pushing it into China. Uh, management, without a shadow of a doubt. Value, I don't think it's expensive. To my mind, it's at the top because it's top of my list. Grinrod, sector, no. Problem with Grinrod. So I interviewed uh, Nick Norman Smith yesterday, the, the, the podcast on, on, on the website. And I love Grinrod. And I value you know what the problem is? It is tied to commodities. They don't mine it, but they move it. I mean, commodity prices are on the dumps. There's less to move, less to charge. They're too tied to commodities. So to my mind, wrong sector. Great quality. Management, I, I, I don't know. I have to put a question mark there. 14 billion is fine value. They are cheap. They are worth less than they currently break up value. Trading book value, 22 rand, trading below 19. But that is my concern. So thanks, Grinrod, but no go. Anchor Capital. Small little stock, you either know of it and you can't, you're bemused by the price, which has gone from two rand to 10 rand in six months since listing, or you've never heard of it. Sector, yes. What do they do? Manage money. What happens, notwithstanding the tax free accounts coming in, again, what, as we get more and more consumers, more and more people working, what do they want to do? They want to save money because they want to save for their future. Never enough, I know, but that's what they want to do. Good sector, quality company, brilliant management. We can see that from how they handled the IPO. Decidedly cheap value, man, this is the most expensive asset management in the world. And I mean that sincerely. If you take market cap to assets under management, the most expensive asset manager in the world. Would I buy it at 10 Rand? No. 
When it's sitting at 200, am I going to look stupid? You bet you. Is it going to 200? I wouldn't bet against it. But I think it's expensive. Adapt IT. So they're not box droppers. They've got uh, Sabu Shabalala, Durban-based company, bought out InfoWave, which was spun out of uh, Ilovo. Um, incredibly, what are they doing? Basically, they're doing the EOH model. They looked at EOH and said, come on, we can do that. What's the EOH model? Really simple. Grow half organic, half by acquisition. Make your acquisitions vertical and horizontal. Lock your management teams in by giving them equity they can't sell for five years. Get government contracts. Look beyond the borders of South Africa and sell IT and specializes in industry. So they specialize in financial services and education. They're moving into the oil and gas sector. At the moment, not a great space. Down the line, we can see how exciting it is. Education, exciting. Financial services, exciting. None of this is rocket science. It's SAP and stuff. But once you're in and you've got the contract, it's hard to get you out. Your risk, it's a people business. I've, I've met Sabu Shabalala. I know him. I don't want to say I know him well. I've met him on social. I've met him in, 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 in professional circumstances. He's an immensely likable. He's an immensely brilliant individual. He can do what Asher Bohart did with EOH. So we've got quality, we've got management, and I think we've got value. I think Adapt IT fits. Capitech, uh, the stars mean I own them. <clears throat> and Discovery I didn't buy. because I'm going to buy Discovery on, on Monday. I waited so I could do the presentation because I don't, I don't want to front run my own presentation. There's something in the lawyers about that. Capitech, yes. Sector, undoubtedly. Quality, we know because look what happened to African Bank and look what didn't happen to Capitech. Management, without a shadow of a doubt. Value, I don't think they massively stretched. The 48 billion might put you off. So our biggest bank right now is first round. It's about 300 billion. Can that go to a trillion rand stock? I don't think if they stay in South Africa, they can. I get they'll add new products and services, but I can't see them being a trillion rand stock. On a trillion rand stock, on a PE of, say, 15, I can't see them doing that level of earnings. I, I can't, I can't, I, I think they've gone at 200 rand, yes, when they're 24 billion, and they were 200 rand in August. At 420, I don't know, they stress me. ShopRite, I own it. Right sector, best management team in the world, great quality, ah, not at that price, not at that price. If a shop right were 85 Rand, I would take my niece and nephew and pawn them off and go and buy shop right shares. <laughs> I would walk to work and sell my car. Okay, I wouldn't do that. And I probably wouldn't be allowed to pawn my niece and nephew. My sister's sticky like that. But the price you pay is so important. So if you buy a shop right now at 175 Rand a share, are you going to do well? Sure. But you're going to do a lot better if you buy at 130. You're going to do a stack lot better at 85. Is it ever going to get to 85? I hope not, because I own a lot. Um, but rather, yeah, it's just too expensive. We have little that we can control. One of the things we can control is the price we pay. Don't pay crazy prices. I love shop right. I would not buy it. I, I have a buy in the market at 125.80. 125 rand and 80 cents. It's been there since October 2013. Yeah, I, I'm young, I'm patient. Actually, I'm not so young, but I'm patient. Um, I can't get my head around that price, so I saw my leave it. Important point, I'm not interested in selling it. So then the next on my list, MTN, I think their sector's wrong. Quality, maybe management. What innovation have we seen? And then we get the worries around Turkcell and the issues around Iran. And I'm like, oh, guys, really? Like, uh, I like the value and I own it and I'm not sure. Kiro, education. I think, I think families will give up a lot before they give up educating their children. Um, probably, I mean, second to last, you cancel DSTV. Last, you cancel the kids' education. So great sector, great quality. Management, I have a concern with, two concerns. They keep on changing their mind. So they came to us and said uh, 20 schools and X learners, and then it was 40 schools, and now it's 80 schools. The third time they raised money, they said we won't do another rights issue. The fourth time they raised money, they said we won't do another rights issue. The fifth time when they raised money, and I bumped into Chris Vandermover at BDTV, and I said to him, are you going to do another one? He said to me, stop asking that question. <laughs> I have a problem with management. Oh, and it's not cheap. So Kuro should be in a PE of 15 or 20, which means earnings must double four times. I can absolutely see that happening. But earnings doubles four times. Share price doesn't move. You're in a PE of 15. Too expensive. Uh, yeah, so then there's Advertech. Good sector, good quality management. How do I know that? Because they just missed the boat. 
Until Kira came along, they did nothing. Now, Frank Thompson is gone, the new chap, Leslie, whoever's in place. I'm unconvinced, but they're also not cheap. They're in a PE of 23. Consolidated Infrastructure Group. So they do reticulation cables. They power the continent. They do those big power lines that ESCOM so desperately needs and that the rest of the continent needs, as does much of Asia and all parts in South America. And in truth, so does North America and Western Europe. They put power lines in place. The problem is when things are tough, governments, I mean, you see it in their last set of results from ARB, ESCOM is not spending on power lines. Why? Because well, why bother? If you haven't got power, you don't need lines, do you? <laughs> so they are quality, they are good management, they are cheap. I worry about that sector. Taste, quick serve, yeah, quality maybe, I don't know. I just don't know enough here, and they're expensive. Spur interests me. The problem is management for 20 years were sleeping at the back of their kitchen. And then they woke up and they heard about this famous brand and they thought, man, we want to be famous too. And they're starting to do it. The clever deal with uh, Grand Parade, the, the clever deal with some backwinter sedation, uh, Rocker Mamas uh, would make smashed hamburgers and all of that sort of thing. But they, there's not much left to buy in South Africa. Hey? If there was much to buy, trust me, Kevin Hedewick has knocked on that door. And if Spurs buying it's because Kevin said he didn't like it or he thought it was too expensive. Uh, and, and our disclosure, Mike, Wagon is hitched to famous brands, um, and, and I worry about that management there. So if we distill it down, <clears throat> to me, the, the no-brainer here is discovery. Absolute no-brainer is discovery. Are we going to see discovery at a, a, a 700 billion rand stock in 10 years? Without a shadow of a doubt. Could it be a trillion or a trillion and a half in 10 years? I think that's entirely possible. Absolutely, I do. But certainly, I mean... It, it, I don't think Discovery's even started to scratch the surface. Even locally, in, in terms of the financial services products that they offer, the health products that they offer, I don't think they've scratched the surface. I think they've got a lot more that they can do. Now, they, they, they do a bit. They've got some life insurance and the like. They, and, and small things, the ability to, to track you. So there's a fancy watch I want to buy which tracks my health and my heart and everything. And if I buy it via Discovery, I get a 30% discount, but I know what the small print says. They want access to that data. I'm scared of Big Brother. Notwithstanding my fear of Big Brother, I think it's discovery. I think it's Adapt, ID, uh, adapt IT and maybe it's KP Tech. That's my absolute yes. That's my maybe and that's my bit of outlier. The maybe ones is Anchor Capital. I just can't. Yeah, man, oh man. I haven't got the wherewithal to buy the most expensive asset manager in the world. But if you have, if you can shut your eyes and buy it, this could be a 200 rand stock in the next 10 or 20 years. And then CIL, which is Consolidated Infrastructure Group, is probably the other of the five. I'm going to come back to that in a sec. It's going to be rocky. There are no smooth rides. If you want a smooth ride, lie down in your bed gently. No, markets are rocky. Uh, what's that stock? NASPAS, 1,400, then down to 1,000, then up to 1,700. There are no smooth rides here. The simple answer is stop watching. You bought the stock, trust yourself, check up on it every six months, every year, go read the annual report, go read the result statement, but do not watch the price day today. Do not watch BDTV and get stressed every time someone says they don't like it. Every time the stock moves half a percent, you panic, you send me an email, say, what should I do? You know what I, I'm going to tell you, turn your TV off. <laughs> With one exception. If I'm on your TV, you don't dare turn it off. <laughs> But constantly come back to your theory. Constantly be checking yourself. This isn't a bottom draw. There are no more bottom draw investing in this day and age. I don't know. General Motors was the bottom draw stock for 60 years until it went bankrupt. So I'm not sure there's any more bottom draw. You've got to keep on coming back. You've got to keep an eye on it. Make sure they're doing. If Capitex uh, cost or income suddenly goes to 55%, I don't want to touch it anymore. All right? Keep an eye on your stocks. But hold tight. Have courage of your conviction. Do not get shaken out. The key point is it takes time. This is not a one or three or five year. This is a 10, 15, 20 year journey. The examples I showed right up front were 10 year examples of, of, of price appreciations. If I went back 20 years, those numbers were double, in some cases triple. I, I don't show those numbers because when I tell people about 6,000% stocks, they want to commit me to the local institutions. 
But these are stocks, when they work, you hold them forever. And it is rocky. It is absolutely. But we don't worry about that. Always, 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 always quality. I had it there five times, but I ran out of space. So I had to take it off. You want the winners. And don't be scared. Discovery is a top 40, 70 billion rand stock. You know what? Once upon a time, SAB, who's now a trillion rand stock, was a 20 billion rand stock. I know because I sold it when it was a 20 billion rand stock. <laughs> Not talking about that. I want to go back to that one. That presentation, questions, for which I have exactly 42 seconds. I talk too much. Yes, sir. Why would you want to be on HSO? Leave that to the company that I hear you. My, my, and, and I, I, so it's not even that EOH is into my top three. It's that it's not on my top, on the 10 I listed at all. Um, and and the, my concern with it is, is what Asher Bohart has done has been absolutely spectacular. The problem is his strategy is grow half, half acquisition, half organic. The acquisition is becoming impossible. The, the deals he has to do are now so massive that they just add fundamental risk to the business. And that's why I didn't put it there. And time will tell. I mean, you know, Asher has proved me wrong every time. So, you know, if, if it's a vote between Simon and Asher, you vote Asher every time because I'm like, you know, I'm like the all-time low. He's like the all-time high. Um, but I worry that the strategy of half-half, that acquisition half becomes almost impossible. Otherwise, he ticks every box. Uh, absolutely. And the fact that it's up two or 3,000 percent doesn't stress me in the least. So RMI is interesting. Short answer, yes. And I didn't delve into it much. But what's RMI got? Discovery. It's got Outsurance, uh, which is a nice product. And it's got Momentum, of course. So in an essence, it, it gives you the channel in. I, I, I'm reticent. Not reticent. I prefer Pure. If I like Discovery, I'm going to buy Discovery. Because I get the RMI, and then I've got these other bits. And they may or may not. But my, my, my uh, trying to think of a word, whatever it is, is aimed at Discovery. But if you've got RMI, you've got the discovery, don't stretch us, you're there. That's which is going to be the future. What do you think about it? So they tick the boxes. Sector, yes. Quality, management, best management team in banking in South Africa, better than Capitex management team probably. Uh, value, sure. Market cap about 300 billion, doesn't scare me. I wonder where they grow to. The youth, I get that. Um, and I also see this Steve campaign has worked for them and the iPads and everything. Because what happens is, I mean, people, I mean, you know, how many people here have swapped, switched banks three times in their life? Anyone switched a bank three times in their life? One, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six. So maybe 10, 10 people. Yeah, so I, I used to bank with Nedbank because in the 80s, if you were serious about money, according to their campaign, you banked with Nedbank. I was, hell, it's money. Of course it's serious. And then I joined Standard Bank and they said, oh, you want to get paid? You better not bank with a green bank. So I moved to Standard Bank. You don't change banks. F&B got people to change banks. That is unheard of in the, in, in the history of banking worldwide. And now you start to cross sell. That's massive. The headwind is Capitec. So I pay 285 Rand. I don't bank at f and I pay 285 Rand to have a bank account. And all that I get from that is that once a year on my birthday, my private banker phones me and wishes me happy birthday. I don't even know it's him until he puts the phone down. And about five minutes later, oh, Eddie, private banker, birthday, got it. Instead, I could go to Capitec for what, 289 Rand, for a lot, of, a lot of wine less, I could be at Capitec. And it's going to be, I think it's hard for the big banks to hang on. So f and is a brilliant bank. I think it's the best bank in South Africa. It's one of the best banks in the world. No, no doubt of that. I don't know how they're going to increase their earnings 20-fold in the next 10, 20 years. That, to me, is the, re the part I can't get my head around. Simon, the property sector has been performing quite well. And mm. I see you don't have anything on, on the property side. I don't. So property has been your best asset class for about the last decade. The first time ever that I have a 10-year rolling period where equities wasn't the best asset class. My problem with property is, is your growth is really inflation plus a bit. You get some extra because you go and buy some and you get some synergies and the like. Um, but the, 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 the price appreciations are really going to happen with acquisitions. There are exceptions. Nepi is an example with Romania. Rock Castle with their Poland and, and the like. Uh, Fortress B. Um, well, A or B. I prefer the B. There are some properties there. But I, to me, I can't get beyond the old... 1980s thinking of property is boring. And that's a failing on my part. I mean, you know, that's just for me. I look at property and I think, ah, blah, you know, and I've had some property and I, I don't at the moment. Um, I'm not a massive fan of it. It's done incredibly well. 
but it's that growth. That growth is inflation plus, and it's locked in because they, they got the tenant things, but it's just inflation plus. Um, evening, Simon. I'm currently sitting with a, with a around about 30% of my shares in Sasol, and you said we should keep away from commodities. So can you classify <sighs> Sasol as part no, of do you. <laughs> Dude, the hardest question in the world. So I own Sassel. I bought my, I bought my first Sassels at about 16 Rand. I bought my last Sassels a couple of months ago at 470. I have for a long time said no, Sassel is different because the world runs on oil. I wrote an article for Finweek last week that I didn't send to the editor because I don't know what to do with it, and I didn't send it this week either. But basically the title of the article is Sassel, I think I erred. I wonder, so I've always given the story which Sassel is different, right? Sector, well, commodity, no, but hey, oil, man, this planet runs on oil. Okay, so I get a tick. Quality, sure, man, they've got tech that people can dream of. Management, not in the old days, but uh, the constable man, he's rocking it up. We've got some management people there. We've got the management. Uh, value, currently, I think around the 400 level, I like Sassel for value. So it ticks all the boxes, but have I conned myself because at the end of the day, oil's just another commodity. And you know what happens? The price goes up, the shell gases come on stream. There's an oil field off the coast of Brazil, which my brother-in-law used to own shares in. I mean, when I say shares, he owned a company which owned a stuff, whatever. The point being is that this field makes Saudi Arabia look like a distant, small little baby cousin. There are two challenges. First, you go through 5.5 kilometers of water, and then you go through 4.5 kilometers of earth, and then you get to the oil. So they need oil at about $250 a barrel. So if oil ever gets to 300, what happens? They turn on the biggest field in the world. What happens to oil price? <sighs> so is oil just not your classic commodity? As soon as the price goes up, every driller in Texas is out there drilling. And as soon as the price goes down, the driller drills up his drill and goes home and has a weekend off. So... I don't know. So at the moment, so here's the challenge. At the moment, Sassel is, is keeping me, no, nothing keeping me awake at night. Sassel is, is keeping me stressed. However, I'm a very slow thinker. Um, but I will communicate via the different channels when I do finally capitulate on Sassel if I do. It is stressing me. I, I'm not stressing the, the share price. I, what's stressing me is I think I made a mistake. Worse, I think I lied to myself. I think I told myself, stay away from commodities, but Sassel is special. That, that is called confirmation bias. I teach about confirmation bias. And I think I just kick my head in the confirmation bias spot. One more question, sir. Sure. Uh, dividends are a thing of beauty. You'll note in all the numbers there I have ex excluded dividends just because it makes the math easier. Uh, short answer, yes. Um, and at the core of a portfolio, dividends are a wonderful thing because it's a cash generating machine. And you can decide to buy whiskey, sassel, uh, discovery, or whatever you want with those dividends. Um, so I like it at the core, but as a as a as an as a as a as a twenty bagger in a decade, unlikely. So to my mind, you've always got that core in the middle. Those 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 nice yielding stocks that spit out cash, and then you put those individuals around this around the edge. Ladies and gents, I'm running time, so I want to end it. I appreciate people who've got places to go uh, and and things to do. Someone said, "Where will I tell you about Sasso? Everywhere. It'll be in my face." I, I will no, because I, I have I have for 15 years been presenting, and for 15 years I've been telling people to buy Sasso. And if I change my mind, I've got to go down on my knees and apologise. I will do it publicly. Don't worry. I am not scared of shame. Um, as always, uh, uh, so so. A last point. That is my list. I will go buy some discoveries on Monday. I gave you guys a head start. You can ramp the, ramp the price up tomorrow. Um, or maybe you could ramp the price down. Hey, a little favor maybe. Um, Adapt IT, I'm thinking about. Capitec, I own, so I'm comfortable with that there. ACG, I can't buy it. Maybe not. It might not be those shares, but understand the logic behind it, and then they will change. But to my mind, discovery is our stock. To my, to my thinking, and 70 billion market cap doesn't scare me. Adrian Gore has ambition, and he looks at 70 billion and says, yeah, that's a good start. Let's get serious now. Is this a 2 trillion rand company in my lifetime? Guar uh, no guarantees. Yes. I, I'm prepared to put my whiskey money in it. Put it that way. There's about as guarantee as you get. Uh, I want to get to that slide there, legal stuff. If you make money, it's yours. If you don't, it's not. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time. We'll be back. We are back 16 April on the tax-free savings accounts. Best thing since online trading. Make sure you're here. Thank you for your time.
This webinar is proudly brought to you by IG South Africa. Visit igmarkets.co.za to open your trading account today.